Hi, everyone, and welcome to Psych 4100, Chapter 4 on Attention. Um, so in this chapter, we're going to cover some of the uh, major sort of historical theories behind attention, how attention works, what attention is. Um, and then as we move sort of towards the end of the chapter, uh, we'll get a little bit more into um, the details of how attention sort of impacts your day-to-day -day life or, or the, the aspects of attention that you might actually be able to, to notice um, as you move and uh, walk about the world. So let's dive into it. <clears throat> Some questions to consider. Uh, is it possible to focus your attention on just one thing? Under what conditions can we pay attention to more than one thing at a time? What does attention research tell us about really practical real world problems like uh, the effect of using a cell phone while driving? And is it true that we actually don't pay attention to most of the things going on around us? So by the end of this chapter, we'll be able to answer each of these questions and many more questions. So to get started, let's define attention. Attention is the ability to focus on specific stimuli or locations in our environment. And so that or locations is actually a really important distinction because we can, uh, and evidence shows that we can attend to objects or we can attend to areas of the environment. Uh, we can do either one. Uh, and it, it sort of uh, taps into the same attentional system. Now, let's um, draw a distinction between perception, which was chapter three, if you remember, and attention. Uh, we can think of attention as being like the next cognitive process that happens after perception. Um, you don't really notice a switch between perception and attention because they're just they're they're pretty integrated, right? Um, the act of perception uh, often involves attention, uh, but this sort of self-directed attention, um, where you are specifically focusing on a stimuli or location, uh, is is the cognitive process directly after perception, right? You, perception is your brain noticing that something is out there in the world. Attention is then your direction of some kind of cognitive activity towards that stimuli or location. And so attention can be thought of as being selective, where we attempt to attend to one thing and ignore others. Or we can think of attention as being divided, maybe such as this scene here. We see the woman who's on the park bench who's trying to read her book. She is trying to selectively attend to the book, but it's possible that her attention becomes divided between all of these distractions in her environment. A nice analogy for attention is a funnel. So we have all of this sensory input coming in somewhere sort of maybe at the, the bridge of this funnel, um, we have perception occurring, right? Sensation comes in, we, we start to perceive things and then only the things that we apply attention to make it out of the funnel. So only things that we apply attention to make it out of the funnel to go what we might call downstream for even further processing. So what this means is, we can already answer one of our questions from the beginning of the lecture. We, in fact, do not attend to the majority of the sensory input that's coming in from the world. Attention pairs down that sensory input into a, into a manageable piece of information that we can start applying higher order processing to. So for example, I'll give you um, a wonderful example of a sensory input that is occurring right now 
to you, to your body. Your brain is registering that sensory input, but you are not attending to it. I want all of you to begin attending to the feel of an article of clothing that is on your body. Hopefully you have some kind of clothing on, I guess this is an online class. You could be doing this naked in your house. If so, go put on some clothes, please, so that we can have this activity in this example. But notice the feel, the weight of your shirts or the sort of feeling of your pants or your shorts on your legs. Maybe even the feeling of your socks or your shoes on your feet. These stimuli in the environment we're providing sensory input, right? Your skin is registering this sensation. It's sending it to your brain. Your brain processes the fact that you're wearing a shirt and you're wearing socks. But somewhere in the funnel, that information gets lost because it's not what you're paying attention to. What you're paying attention to, hopefully, is this lecture in my voice. So what you've done is you've used this process called selective attention to filter out unnecessary information and focus on the important information in your environment to promote further processing. So some of the earliest experiments done on selective attention are known as dichotic listening. Uh, they're called dichotic, di meaning, meaning two, um, cotic, right, meaning sort of audition, uh, hearing. So sort of double hearing. Um, basically what happened was researchers gave participants headphones such that they could present uh, a spoken message to the left ear and then a different spoken message to the right ear. You've all probably experienced this um, listening to music. Many bands take advantage of the sort of uh, the fact that most people are listening to, to music in a with a left input and a right input. And if you are <clears throat> got the time and creativity and a good enough producer, you can mix a song such that it actually has dynamics um, where the, the, the sound coming from the song in your left ear is different from your right ear. And there's people who think that that has some advantages for listening. But here, we're not worried about making a song sound good. What we're worried about is presenting a, one spoken message to the left ear, another spoken message to the right ear, and then testing people's ability to focus or attend to one of the messages and ignore the other. So it looks like this. You've got your headphones on. Over here in this ear, you're hearing a passage. You know, the meaning of life is blank, blank, blank. Uh, over here in the other ear, you're hearing another maybe story or a passage. The yellow dog chased the car down the road, whatever, whatever. And your instructions are to either repeat or, you know, pay attention to one of the messages maybe the yellow dog chased, and then ignore the other message. So you say the words out loud. The focus of that is to get you to pay attention exclusively to one message and ignore the other one. So then the question becomes, do you get any information from the unattended ear? So if we're attending to our right ear, then the research question became, well, what do I get from the left ear if I'm not paying attention to it? And what the original research here found is that people were unable to report the content of the unattended ear's message. They don't know what it was about, but they could tell you that there was something going on. There was a message. And interestingly, they could tell you whether the speaker was male or female. So these two facts are important because what they suggest is that in the unattended message, people were registering the physical properties of the message. 
Was it soft? Was it loud? Were they male? Were they female? They can tell that a message exists and they know something about its physical properties, but they couldn't tell you anything about its meaning, its content. So what this means is that the unattended ear is being processed at some level. It's at a, at a basic, maybe a really low physical foundational level, but it, it's probably not being processed at a meaningful content level. So uh, further experiments showed that if you change the person's gender in the unattended ear, people notice it. If you change the tone of voice in the unattended ear, people notice it. And then we have this thing that we're, got, we're gonna encounter in a few slides known as the cocktail party effect. So what this led to were multiple, what we're gonna call models of selective attention. Because there's some ambiguity here, right? Um, if participants can report some things from the unattended ear, but not others, then there's some intermediate combination of attention and processing that's taking place. So how do we define exactly what that intermediate level of processing is? Well, the first attempt at this was called an early selection model uh, by a psychologist named Broadbent. And then we had some later um, models of selective attention known as the intermediate model or Treisman's attenuation model. And then we have some models that are called late selection. We're gonna go through and discuss uh, the differences between these models of attention. So the first one, Broadbent's filter model. This is an early selection. So we have information coming in to our senses in a, in a place called sensory memory. We'll talk more about that when we discuss um, memory in a few chapters. But basically, sensory information comes into the brain. Then attention, like, is this filter, right? This box that says filter is attention. It's the process of attention. Attention takes all of this information and pairs it down only to the attended message. And then the attended message goes to what was hypothesized as something like a detector, meaning the first place where processing occurs, such that we might be able to detect elements of a stimulus that we're looking for. So the implication of this model is basically that attention is perfect, right? The only information that goes on to further processing is the attended message. Once you apply the filter, only the attended message gets through, nothing else. And so this detector is the first place where meaningful processing occurs, and it's after the filtering. Now, the problem with this original model is that it doesn't fit the evidence because we already know from our first experiments with attention that it's not perfect because people could pick out things like the gender of the unattended message. So, uh, sorry, this is just another uh, another slide on the Broadbent filter. This basically just kind of says all the things that I just said out loud. And the end of his filter, the detector, which is where high level processing is gonna start occurring, the detector is the thing that shifts information into what's known as short-term memory. Uh, this is basically your consciousness, right? Your conscious awareness, uh, your ability to sort of think about and hold information for like 10 to 15 seconds. That's, think of short-term memory as conscious awareness. So let's go through the model completely again. Information comes in from the senses. We apply a filter to that information. The filter is perfect. Only the attended message gets through. The attended message then begins um, processing for detecting its important elements. 
and the detector sends that information along to memory or conscious awareness. So Broadbent could not explain the cocktail party phenomena. Let's talk about what that is. Because the cocktail party phenomena basically tells us that this model of attention is incomplete. Um, so think back to our dichotic listening, message in the right ear, a different message in the left ear. And imagine that in the unattended ear, the researchers slip into the recording the name of the participant. So uh, you're listening in the, in the right ear to a message that you're repeating out loud. And so you're not really paying attention to the left ear, but suddenly you hear your name and it draws your attention. This is known as the cocktail party phenomena. Uh, because apparently early attentional researches, researchers, researchers, geez, early attentional researchers really liked to drink cocktails at parties. And one of them noticed that um, you're sort of in a cocktail party. Maybe you're talking to a small group of people. Um, there's sort of this buzz of ambient noise. Maybe there's some music in the background. There's some clinking of of glasses, there's people walking and, and milling about and other people talking, but you're not really paying attention to any of that. You're attending to the conversation between you and your little group of friends. And then across the room, you hear Jennifer, you hear your name. And we all kind of have this experience where in sort of a crowd like that, your name seems to pop out pops out from the ambient noise and you seem to be able to attend to it more easily or it, it maybe to put it in a different way, it butts its head into your attention. It forces its way into your attention. So this is called the cocktail party phenomena and it's based upon some things that we'll talk about in a few slides, but basically your name is something that you hear a lot. It's a very common stimulus. So your brain gets used to hearing it and it starts to dedicate processing just to hearing and processing your name. And furthermore, your name, in addition to being a common stimulus, is a very important stimulus for you to listen and attend to. Because when someone says your name, it means often that you are needed, that something is being asked of you, something is needed of you, or somebody over there is talking about you and you need to go set them straight, right? Your name is important. So what this means is that different stimuli in the environment have different thresholds for their ability to be attended to. Your name has a very low threshold. It pops out at the first opportunity. Well, if Broadbent was correct, then this could not be the case, right? This theory of attention does not allow for the cocktail party phenomena, because it basically says that the filter is perfect, but it's not. The filter is not perfect and we can demonstrate it quite easily. Uh, furthermore, another experiment that illustrates the, the um, problems with Broadbent's model were called the Dear Aunt Jane experiments. This basically involves dichotic listening again, where the researchers intentionally manipulate the attended message to sort of bounce back and forth between the left and the right ear. And even though people are told, attend only to your right ear, um, they're capable of bouncing back and forth from ear to ear as needed in order to listen to that attended message. So uh, there's there seems to be more processing occurring at the unattended message than we thought at first. This unattended message processing motivated a psychologist named Treisman to revise Broadbent's theory. And he revised Broadbent's theory into what's known as the attenuator model or an intermediate selection model. He basically says, okay, so Broadbent was mostly right. 
a, the attenuator is is Treisman's word for filter or attention. Attention, you know, filters out all the unwanted stuff and it gives more weight to the attended message. That's the big fat arrow here. But a weak signal from the unattended message does make it through to processing. So a weak amount of signal from the unattended message makes its way to processing. He called this processing unit um, the dictionary unit because he was thinking about it mostly in terms of language. Right? So the attenuator analyzes your incoming message in terms of physical characteristics, language, linguistics, and meaning. The attended message basically uh, is let through the attenuator at full strength, at full throttle. And the unattended message is attenuated. It is weakened in strength. Now, the advantage here is that this weak unattended message makes it to processing, and that's where the cocktail party phenomena occurs. That's where the ability to pick out the gender or the tone of voice in the unattended message occurs. It's a weak signal, so we only get certain bits of information from it. We don't get the full amount of information, but we get a little bit of information from this unattended message. Uh, the dictionary unit is basically his thing that uh, processes uh, meaning of words. <clears throat> and this is where we get these differences in threshold for activation. So uh, words like your name have a very low threshold for activation. Thus, you pay attention to them more easily. But uncommon words have high thresholds for activation. And so for example, if you're at a cocktail party and someone says your name, that's a low threshold word. So you're going to start to attend to it. If someone across the cocktail party says the word rutabaga, you don't really give a shit about someone saying the word rutabaga. It is an uncommon word. It's not important or meaningful to you. And so you never even process it. You never even pay attention to it. So <clears throat> here we have uh, sort of a depiction of what thresholds, uh, differences in thresholds might look like in the dictionary unit of Treisman. So your name has a very low threshold, meaning any amount of signal is going to trigger um, activation of processing. An extremely rare and unimportant word like rutabaga has a high threshold of activation such that Someone would have to be like screaming the word rutabaga for you to pay attention to it. And then most words have some sort of intermediate amount of uh, threshold for activation. But notice that thresholds for activation will be different from person to person because, you know, you don't have a low threshold for my name, right? I have a low threshold for my name. It's individual to me. So what this suggests is that, I don't know, imagine that you have a friend who is in fact a rutabaga farmer and they hear the word rutabaga across the cocktail party because that word is important to them, but you don't hear it, right? Your friend goes, oh, hey, they're talking about rutabagas over there. And you go, what? Who gives a shit about rutabagas? He's like, I do. I'm a rutabaga farmer. I'm going to pay attention to that conversation now. So these differences in threshold <clears throat> will change depending on individual's experience. And finally, we have what are known as late selection models of attention. These models suggest that, <clears throat> um, that the final selection for which stimuli to attend to does not occur until after processing does not that that the selection of which message is the attended message doesn't happen until later in the process so the late selection model suggests that there's a lot more processing going on 
And then once that processing has occurred, then we make selections about information to attend to. Uh, one of the classic experiments that does provide good evidence for this is McKay, 1973. Um, they gave participants, again, the dichotic listening paradigm. And in the attended ear, participants heard the sentence, uh, heard a sentence such as, they were throwing stones at the bank. The key here is that bank is semantically ambiguous. Here, bank could mean a river bank, or bank could mean the building where you keep money, right? The bank. So we have a semantically ambiguous sentence. Is this people skipping rocks on a river, or is this people, you know, um, assaulting a bank with rocks? Now, in the unattended ear, so the, the message that participants are supposed to not pay attention to, they heard the word river or money. River or money. The idea being that this unattended word might influence their interpretation of the ambiguous sentence. And in fact, that's what happened. Participants were much more likely to choose or to interpret the meaning of the attended message as the one consistent with the biasing word that they heard. So when told, when asked to sort of interpret the ambiguous sentence, if you heard the word river, you were more likely to say something about people throwing stones at a riverbank. If you heard the word money, you were more likely to say that people were throwing stones at a, the building that keeps money. So this biasing word affected participants' choices of how to interpret that, unattend that ambiguously attended message. And participants were generally unaware of these biasing words. They didn't know that they were occurring. And so what it suggests is that even in the unattended message, the word river and money were processed for their meaning, not just their physical properties. They were processed for their meaning. So we have um, evidence to support basically all three models of attention in some respect. We know that broadband was incomplete. It was, you know, sort of generally right, but Treisman's model um, qualified that to fit with the known evidence. Uh, and then later in the 70s, we have some evidence that, no, there's some late selection that's probably occurring as well. So what we're left with is the sort of mixed models of attention, where attention probably works uh, somewhere between Treisman's attenuator model and uh, a McKay late selection model. So attention is really kind of living uh, in between or is a combination of those two models. Now there's a slightly different way that we can sort of conceptualize attention and that's through its cognitive load or perceptual load. Um, because one of the reasons we need attention is that we can't possibly process everything that's coming into us. We can't do it. It's too much information. The load would be too high. So presumably, humans have some capacity for processing, right? The maximum amount of information a person can handle at any given moment. And people probably vary. There's probably individual differences in the exact capacity of uh, processing from person to person. So we can think about them as being this circle or, you know, maybe a bucket, right? Uh, and if you're given a low load task or an easy task, then it only takes up so much of your bucket and you have the rest of your bucket to fill with other tasks, right? You can do other things versus 
a high load or a difficult task might completely take up your bucket and you've got no room for anything else. So perceptual load is the idea that tasks vary in the amount of capacity they take up. So uh, for example, basic arithmetic, right? Addition and subtraction is a low load task for a college student, hopefully, but maybe calculus is a high load task for that same student. So you can do basic arithmetic uh, probably while you even have a conversation or watch TV or listen to music or read a book or drive your car, right? You can do lots of things if, if I'm only asking you to do arithmetic. If I'm asking you to do calculus, you're probably not going to be able to drive your car very well, nor are you going to be able to pay attention to a TV show because it's a difficult high load task. Again, just with our discussion of thresholds, people are going to vary on what is considered a high versus a low load task for them. So a professor of mathematics should theoretically, and I think it would be reasonable to assume, have a uh, lower load for doing calculus than you or I do. So expertise and practice can take things that were once high load tasks and make them low load tasks. In fact, I would argue that's basically the definition of expertise is the ability to take something that was a high load task and through practice and repetition and analysis, turn it into a low load task. <clears throat> so, uh, to illustrate this idea of perceptual load in a, in a very classical way, we're going to engage in what's known as the Stroop test. Some of you may have done this before. Um, if so, play along. If not, this is really cool. I'm going to walk you through this experiment that's been done, you know, in various ways for various reasons, you know, hundreds of times in, in subtle variations. And it really helps us learn a lot about um, a whole host of things in cognitive psychology including attention. So what you see before you is an, an array of shapes. I want you to start up here in the left top left-hand corner and move to the right and then down, like as if you're, you know, reading words on a page. So we're going to start at the left, move to the right, and then down each row. And I just want you as quickly as possible to, to name the color of each shape the color of each shape as quickly as possible. There's 15 shapes. So you have to name 15 colors. So on the count of three, do this as quickly as possible. One, two, three. So I'll do it for you as quickly as I can. Red, blue, yellow, orange, purple, green, yellow, purple, blue, red, orange, purple, red, yellow, green. So you should be pretty quick. Um, you probably get a little, you know, sort of um, screwed up once or twice, kind of like I did. I had to slow down a little bit because it is a lot of information, but you can do this pretty easily and basically error free. And if you practice this, you could get like super fast at it, right? Now, I want you to do the same task, but now the stimuli have changed. The stimuli are now words, but I still want you to name out loud the color of the ink, not the word. Do not read the words. Name the color of the ink as quickly as possible, starting up here and moving to the right and down. So again, don't read the words. Name the color of the ink. Ready, set, go.
So this is much more difficult. Uh, I'll do it so that you can see how quickly I can do it. Um, blue, orange, green, yellow, red, purple, red, blue, orange, green, yellow, orange, green, purple, red. So I'm, I didn't make any errors, but I'm much slower and it's much more difficult. And I have the experience of it almost like it's like coming to the edge of my mouth and I have to like, I have to suppress reading the word and fight through it and say the color instead, right? That's sort of my uh, almost physical manifestation of the difficulty of the task. I, my brain wants to read the word, but I have to push it down and then I have to force out the name of the color of the ink instead. So this is known as the Stroop effect. It shows us that the name of the words, right? The word yellow, the word red, the word blue interferes with your ability to name the color of the ink because you cannot avoid paying attention to the meaning of the words. It's unavoidable. Um, I, I dare you to look at a word and not read it, right? It doesn't even make sense. Reading just happens automatically. So what that means is that the words are increasing the load of the task and making it difficult. Because now you have two things going on. You have reading and then you have sort of the visual search and identification of color. So the addition of that task creates additional load and thus draws your attention, right? It takes up some of your bucket of attention and slows down processing ability. So this very simple experiment shows us something really profound about one language that lang you know, reading is automatic, uh, but two, it uses that to show us something really cool about attention. Okay. Uh, this is a nice put place to stop uh, and chop our lecture in half from part one to part two. So thanks for listening. Um, pick back up right here with overt attention in the part two voiceover of chapter four. Thanks, everybody. And I will talk to you next time.